Good, e good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. You can find us on the internet at commonwealthclub.org and also on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. I'm Mark Zitter. I'm chair of the Zetima Project, which is a diverse group of healthcare leaders of whom or of which uh, today's speaker is a member. And I am also a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors and obviously your moderator for today's program. For those listening on the radio or podcast, today is September 26, 2017. And I'm mentioning that because I had to wait until this morning to write my introduction. It's already out of date. Uh, I, I, I printed these pages out less than an hour ago and they're already out of date. What we heard on the Twitter accounts just a few minutes ago is that it looks like the, uh, the Graham-Cassidy bill, which of course is the bill to repeal and replace uh, the Affordable Care Act, is not going to be brought for a vote. That's what it looks like. <laughs> you, tell, you can see where this audience's politics lie. I will say, we however- We are in San Francisco, I do right. recognize that. <laughs> I will say, however, that after November, I'm out of the prognostication business. <laughs> so this bill has, this uh, effort has uh, died many, many deaths and has arisen. But as far as we know at this point, it's probably not going to be uh, sent to a vote. And of course, the Affordable Care Act, also known as the ACA or Obamacare, will be discussing much uh, today. Uh, the debates about the act, as well as the debates about repealing it and replacing it, have focused primarily on coverage and payment for healthcare, very important. However, what's not been discussed nearly so much is the underlying cost of healthcare delivery in America. And it's that cost which makes the two sides getting together particularly difficult. Obviously, if our costs were in line with other developed countries, it would be a lot easier to come up with the funding for paying for healthcare for as many Americans as possible. And that will continue to be an issue uh, regardless of whether Graham Cassidy or some other bill arises once again. Fortunately, today's speaker is an expert in both the Affordable Care Act and in transforming healthcare delivery. Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel is the former chief policy advisor to the Obama administration and a key architect of Obamacare. He's also the chair of the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the University of Pennsylvania and author of the new book, Prescription for the Future, the 12 Transformational Practices of Highly Effective Medical Organizations. Now, I think that probably most of you in this audience need no convincing that healthcare delivery in the US needs transformation and not just to reduce costs, which of course are by far the highest in the world, but also to improve quality and convenience and satisfaction. Dr. Emanuel's book contains specific and field-tested approaches that lead to high quality, efficient care. And the book also has a special chapter on how to expand the approaches that he's found across the nation. In addition to his academic post at Penn, Dr. Emanuel is also a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and a breast oncologist. He holds both a medical degree and a PhD in political philosophy from Harvard University. Let's give a warm Commonwealth Club welcome to Dr. Thank Dr. You. Emanuel. Thank you. So Zeke, it's great to have you back at the Commonwealth Club. Yeah, I think uh, this is my fourth or fifth appearance. It's always a great audience, uh, very educated and always has great questions. Well, it's interesting when you were here in January, it was just uh, around the time of the inauguration and uh, repeal and replace was in the air. It, it still is, even if it's ha not as much as happened. And I already crossed out my first question, which was about how you felt about the Graham-Cassidy bill, because I think it's, it's, it's maybe more important right now to say, look, let's say that the bill never comes to a vote. Uh, and let's say that the Democrats and the Republicans can't agree on anything else. If there's no new legislation that passes for the foreseeable future, what happens to the marketplaces? Uh, well, in some places like California, uh, there's uh, stress, but you guys are gonna do fine. In other places, the stress is gonna be much more substantial. And we should also be quite clear that uh, premiums are higher. Uh, substantially higher unless we get some uh, better behavior out of Washington. Um, and let me just explain that there are, no, there are uh, all health policy uh, uh, people agree that there are three or four kind of immediate policies that could be put into place that would actually substantially strengthen uh, the exchanges and make, uh, most importantly, make premiums come down, which would be good for obviously 
people uh, who are trying to buy insurance as well as good for the government uh, that is providing subsidies. The higher the premiums, the more the subsidies, the more we all are paying uh, for those subsidies. So let me just say what those are. One is to guarantee the so-called cost-sharing uh, subsidies. These are uh, payments that the insurance companies make to uh, individuals who have low income to help them cover the deductibles and cover the co-pays and co-insurance for using the health care system. Uh, they are uh, in the bill. The financing is a little peculiar in the bill, um, and they have been there, uh, but the Republicans have been threatening to pull them not guaranteeing their funding. Uh, and as a consequence, insurance companies are on the line to pay those cost-sharing subsidies. That's the way the bill's written. And if the government doesn't fund them, they simply jack up premiums to cover those added costs. So if the government says, yes, we're going to pay them, that will immediately reduce premiums between 5 and 10%. Second is reinsurance. So some companies, again, it was in the uh, Affordable Care Act legislation that there'd be a reinsurance pool because, you know, when you start a new uh, venture in insurance, you don't know who's buying, you don't know how sick they are compared to the population, compared to what you estimate, because you have no track record. Uh, we still don't have a great track record, um, in part because uh, a third of the people go in and out of the exchange every year. So you, it, it's very hard to know who you're selling to any particular year. It's hard, therefore, to make actuarial predictions and to accurately price. So reinsurance is one way of actually lowering the risk on insurance companies. And the moment you lower the risk on insurance companies, they will lower the premiums in turn, again, worth about 5 or 10%, according to most insurance companies. So right there, if you instituted just th those two fixes, which are relatively cheap, you can actually bring down premiums for uh, all the Americans who are buying individual coverage in the exchanges. Uh, a third policy, particularly targeted at those counties in the United States that the Republicans tout uh, as being bare, either no insurance companies playing, there aren't that many of them, or only one, you could say, look, any insurance company which offers to cover, go into a bare county or a county with only one uh, a competing insurer, we're actually going to relieve them of some of their, the taxes that they have to pay as part of the Affordable Care Act. This would be a very good incentive for insurance companies to go into these rural, uh, especially rural counties. Um, the last thing that I think would be, uh, or the last two things that I think would be helpful is, in, say you're going to enforce the individual mandate. It is the law of the land. It's interesting to me. Republicans are law and order type, and yet they're not going to uh, vigorously inf enforce that law. They don't like it, so we're not enforcing it. Seems to me that might be uh, called a contradiction in some people's book. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the other thing is uh, targeted advertising to healthy young people. As I like to say, here I am in the home of uh, high tech, you know, uh, Google and Facebook know exactly uh, income of young adults. They know whether they have insurance, right? They can target them pretty accurately with, you know, you could get health insurance calculating their income for probably this amount of money. Here's the link to the exchange in your state. I think doing more of that kind of advertising um, would help tremendously to get these young people in by re reducing the barrier and giving them accurate information. Given a subsidy, here's how much it would actually cost you and uh, uh, deploy that advertising during the open enrollment period. You know, there are four or five things. They're not expensive. They're not hard. They're not, you know, this isn't, uh, as we like to say, putting a man on the moon um, that uh, we could agree to. I think one of the advantages uh, um, of the demise of, uh, of Graham-Cassidy uh, bill is that the uh, bipartisan negotiation that had been going on in Washington, now we're really getting into the weeds here, between Senator Lamar Alexander, who's chairman of the House of the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, and Patty Murrah, the, pin, the point person from the Democratic side, uh, on negotiating the extension and, and, and the sort of stabilization of the marketplaces. That had been going on. The Republicans put it on ice uh, pending uh, getting Graham-Cassidy. With the demise of Graham-Cassidy, hopefully they'll refocus attention. I think the issue for all of you to keep your eye on is how big is that compromise bill or how narrow is it? Uh, we would prefer it to be big because it probably will bring down premiums more um, and stabilize the marketplace longer. Um, but hopefully there's bipartisan agreement on that. Uh, by the way, if, if the exchanges fail, this isn't a Democratic problem anymore. You can't blame Barack, blame Barack Obama. You know, this is a Trump, uh, Secretary Price, uh, uh, McConnell problem. They have the power to solve it. 
They know the Democrats want to do it. Um, and I just hope the president realizes, you know, he got a lot of bump out of the deal with uh, uh, Nancy and Chuck. Maybe he should make another deal with Nancy and Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's interesting, too, because, of course, the Affordable Care Act dealt with three different areas, uh, had some um, features that affected pretty much anybody with insurance. It had features that affected Medicaid and expansion, and it created these individual marketplaces. The marketplaces are where we get most of the attention, but it's really only, only 3 or 4% of the population. Very important, but only yes. 3 or 4% of the population. Right. And I think one of the reasons it gets a lot of attention is that uh, people can imagine uh, my company might cut back its insurance. I might lose my job. Uh, sort of scenarios, I want to know that there's a safety net there and that the safety net is reasonable. It's less the total numbers and I think the psychological effect of, you know, I'm going to be okay. If we ha have another terrible recession, I'm still going to have ha a, a way to get health insurance. Um, and I think that is very powerful for many, many people. Yeah. Now, Graham Cassidy and really all of the Republican efforts to repeal the Affordable Care Act uh, had impacts or potential impacts that fell into two categories, I would say, very simplistically. One is a whole bunch of policy changes, and the other is funding reductions, at least right. based on what was expected. And I want to ask you, if the funding had not been reduced, if it was expected to be sort of just as planned, how would you have felt about the policy changes? Um, <laughs> I don't know what just as planned means, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll tell you why. So. Uh, the premise of, of uh, uh, Graham Cassidy is give more power to the states, and the states, they're closer to the voters, they'll do right, et cetera. Um, uh, now, there's a lot of truth to that. There's also a lot of problems with that, and I just want to highlight one problem. It depends what the formula for funding is, and here, uh, unfortunately, the details really matter. What the Republicans have really, really been itching to do is to make Medicaid not open-ended so that it doesn't go up when more people need it and go down when fewer people need it, but that it's a predictable budget or, and therefore limited budget uh, cap. The problem with that is the Great Recession. Suddenly, unemployment expands, companies cut back on insurance, more people need government help through Medicaid, through the exchanges, um, and yet you've limited how much uh, you're, the federal government's going to help the states. That leads to rationing. And I use that word, which has been used very viciously against me by Republicans, not without thinking about it very carefully. Because what happens if you tell a state, all right, lots of people now need health care, but the federal assistance to you is not going to be there. We're not increasing the amount we're going to give you. We're going to block grant it or somehow limit it, which is the heart of the Graham-Cassidy bill, and I think Republicans are not going to give up on that. Well, suddenly you have some very difficult choices, and I just want to remind you, you know, this audience looks like it has a pretty good memory. 2010, Republican governor in Arizona, Jan Brewer, right, they had a, we were in the middle of the Great Recession, they thought they had a crisis in funding Medicaid. What did they go out and do? They cut life-saving bone marrow transplant, which is curative for cancer patients, right? And watched some of their citizens who could have been cured from their cancer die. Did that solve their budget problem? Their budget problem was like $2.6 billion, and this was worth about $800,000 in the first year. And yet, that's where they went. Um, pretty vicious program. So you tell me all oh, the states be very careful with their citizens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe not so careful. And one of the reasons we have federal government minimum requirements and things like Medicaid is because we know that some states will cut back below those requirements. You can look at states and in the old Medicaid, when it wasn't just based on income, when it was based on other things, uh, there were a lot of states which I would say were pretty vicious with uh, healthy young adults who were working but whose company didn't provide health insurance and weren't making that much money, they were at minimum wage or something, you know, they couldn't get health insurance through Medicaid. They're not getting help. I mean, the fact that they're not getting health insurance is not because they're lazy or not working, it's because their employer just could not afford it. Um, and yet the state wouldn't step in and provide them a safety net. So yes, states may be closer to people, but sometimes they make choices which can be very, very painful and very, very undermining of 
uh, poor people in their state. So while I'm, I understand the motivation to give power back to the states, I also think we need federal minimal safeguards. And part of the thing that Republicans have consistently wanted to do is get rid of those minimum safeguards, uh, uh, which are especially important for poor people, people with disabilities, uh, elderly children, exactly the kind of people who you know, are in uh, a poor or, or a state and need health care through no fault of their own. Okay. Well, and that's a big charge that typically Democrats make against Republicans and, and the, these Zetama meetings where we've got a lot of Republicans and the Democrats. That's what I'd boil down to be the biggest, the biggest challenge that Democrats throw at Republicans. The biggest challenge that Republicans throw at Democrats is saying, well, that's all well and good, but Democrats are very good at identifying places where we need to spend more money and creating or designing um, health care programs that are open-ended that are going to blow the budget without good cost controls. Right. How do you respond to that charge? Well, I, I'm a guy who, uh, as I like to say, swings from the left, and every speech that I give begins with focusing on the cost of the healthcare system and cost control, and my new book is really about places that are knocking it out of the park by not only providing the best quality care, but actually doing it at a low price uh, and being very cost effective about it. I think us liberals have to care about costs in the healthcare system, and we should not just care about, you know, giving more and being more comprehensive. We do need to take costs seriously, and uh, I think uh, that's very important for exactly the things we care about. So let me just tell you two rationales for why I think costs ought to be forefront in liberals' minds. Um, many of you have might, might have noticed the last two years have been very good in terms of increasing worker wages. You may have noticed last week an announcement by, um, I think it was the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, uh, the median income in America, that's where 50% of the population is below, 50% is above, rose uh, just under $60,000. $3,000 increase uh, in one year, and the previous year, 2015, we also had a big bump in wages. Uh, um, so. Where's that bump in wages coming from? You got a lot of economists hypothesizing and giving a lot of theories, you know, labor shortage because of the retirement of the baby boomers, the eighth year of a uh, uh, expanding economy, um, low labor market participation, all those economic things I don't understand. One thing I haven't seen out there, which is very, very important is, a lot of that wage increases because healthcare costs have been under control. Now I know a lot of Americans are skeptical. Oh, my deductibles are going up, my premiums are going up. But overall healthcare costs have actually, since 2011, been relatively flat. Uh, you can see the graph, it goes like this, increase, 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 and then from 2011, basically a plateau at about 17.5% of GDP. Uh, that also is true, by the way, for uh, um, Kaiser uh, Family Foundation every year look, does a survey of employer premiums and it turns out that employer premiums also have been going up less than they had in the entire previous decade. What's that mean for workers? Well, it means that a lot of their wage increase is the fact that healthcare, that uh, work, uh, employers don't have to put so much money into their insurance, health insurance premiums. So. This is, I like to say, a bipartisan issue, not Republican, Democrat, but business labor issue that if we can control healthcare costs, we can actually get those middle class wages to go up because less money's going to healthcare, more money's going to the pocket of workers. So we on the left who care about worker wages and trying to get worker wages up, we have to care about controlling healthcare costs for that reason. Here's a second one, which I know plays big in California, public edu university education. States have had a lot of pressure from Medicaid costs going up, uh, and that pressure has translated into cuts in higher education. Why are tuition at state universities going up across the country? Why are state legislators cutting back in their subsidy or in their payments for uh, prestige universities like the UCAL system? Because a lot of that money has to go to Medicaid, right? If we keep healthcare costs under control, right? It frees up parts of state budgets to do things we care about, education, environment, uh, infrastructure, and things like that. So if we're liberal and we want more investment in education, not just higher education, but also primary, secondary education, more investment in infrastructure, more investment in the environment, things we deeply care about, we have to keep healthcare costs under control so that state budgets have more 
uh, cash, not going into health care, but going into uh, the things we care about. So my argument is liberals need to care about cost control, and we should not cede that to Republicans. We do care about it when it's drug costs, but it's not just drug costs. It's hospital costs, it's doctor costs, it's home health agency costs, it's nursing home costs, it's skilled nursing facilities, it's the whole device costs, it's the whole range. So let's talk about costs um, <laughs> and, and your, your new book. I, your publisher was good enough to send me a copy of the book for me to read prior to this uh, session. I traveled with it. You I, slept a lot? Uh, no, I, I traveled with it. Actually, I, I, I took it uh, with me to Boston and uh, left it in a hotel. <laughs> went out and had read half of it, so I went out and bought the rest with my own, my own dollar. But somewhere in the greater Boston area, there is a, a hotel a housekeeper who's very well informed about health care <laughs> delivery, right? So if you were to speak to that person or if he or she were to speak to you, what would you want them to take away from the book? Uh, that you should be wildly optimistic about the, American, the future of the American health care system. Uh, and uh, so I make this outlandish prediction uh, that by 2030, the United States is going to have a healthcare system that really uh, the rest of the world looks at and the rest of the world wants to know how we've done a lot of the things that uh, we've done in terms of transformation. That's 13 years from now. Moving the healthcare system is not easy. It's not going to happen in a flash. But uh, when you go around this country and you see uh, the kinds of innovations that are happening in terms of improving quality and reducing costs, you really do believe we can do it. And what we need to do is to identify what those changes are and create the financial incentives in terms of payment to actually induce doctors, hospitals, and all the other providers in the system to actually implement them. So one of the things I think that I tried to understand as I was going around the country is what are the practices of the best performing systems that everyone's talking about? Um, we're not going to take the systems, pick them up, and put them everywhere. You know, someone keeps asking me about Kaiser uh, here in Northern California. You know, you guys are, are the home of Kaiser. And, and it's like you're not going to take Kaiser and it, implanted in Nebraska and Iowa and South Dakota. Uh, but you are going to take Kaiser practices and Kaiser ideas that they have done and, and mastered in certain areas, and those are readily movable and adoptable by different healthcare organizations. And so I went around the country looking for what are those practices, not what's the superstructure, what are the practices that we can do. We came up with 12 um, uh, different ones, and I like to say they go everything from scheduling. How does a patient schedule an appointment, um, and how does a doctor's office organize those appointments uh, through chronic care coordination, through behavioral health, which I think is one of these big, big areas that we need to address, and there's lots of both savings and improving quality there, through uh, end of life care, community health workers, and even you know lifestyle changes, more exercise, better diets. Um, the interesting thing to me um, is, you know, even at the best performing systems, um, and I looked at one Kaiser, not here in California, but out in uh, the East Coast, uh, uh, the Mid Atlantic, Washington, Virginia, and Maryland. Um, not even the best places that have been doing this for three or four decades are doing all 12 practices. So even at the top, there's room for uh, substantial improvement. Um, uh, but there are practices, we know, as you said, that they're sort of tried and true and tested, um, and places have to go out, implement them. It's not easy, and that's the other thing. I, don't, I didn't say, oh, by next year, we'll begin seeing 5 and 10% savings. It takes time. All the gurus, you know, the business school gurus on change uh, will tell you it takes time. You know, changing an organization is a 10-year process. You see the most change at about year four or five. So you have to keep at it. That doesn't mean you don't get wins early on in years one and two, but you have to keep at it. You can't declare victory after one successful year, um, getting the culture of a place to change. So you're no longer just focusing on doing more, you know, knee operations or doing more bypasses or stents or something. You're focused really on keeping people healthy and changing how you uh, take care of them when they're sick. That takes time to uh, change uh, doctors. And you talk about six essential sort of catalyzing elements to, to, to accelerate that change because the fact is it's one-sixth of our economy healthcare, almost one yep. in ten jobs. There's a lot of inertia. A, a lot of, as you say, healthcare providers 
are doing okay. So everyone's generally in favor of cutting costs, but you know, costs are someone else's income, right? And everyone in this room either works in healthcare or knows a lot of people who do. It's, it's one, in, one in 10 jobs or so. So we can't talk about all six, but I thought let's bring up one of the first ones or one of I think the most important ones. You talk about providers assuming financial risk. Right, right. Talk about what that means, why it's important, and how far along the line we are with that. So if you uh, ask a doctor, you know, I want you to deliver cost-effective care, get rid of the unnecessary care, um, uh, try to bring prices down, you know, the first thing doctor's gonna say is, uh, you know, he may not say it out loud, or she may not say it out loud, but it's like, as you pointed out, that's my income, right? I don't order those tests, that somehow is gonna be my income, and you're asking me to take an income cut. We need to have a situation where doctors uh, are incentivized okay, when there are two or more treatments to actually do the treatment that are clinically equivalent. And I, I'm not talking about skimping on care at the risk of uh, damaging someone, but there are lots and lots of cases of where there are clinically equivalent treatments. Ask the doctor to choose the cheapest one. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a very good uh, example of how this can actually be uh, really, really important. So Care More is actually based in Southern California on the southern part of LA. They deal with frail elderly. Um, they don't develop their own guidelines. They basically take guidelines that are uh, promulgated by professional societies and others, and they have guidelines for diabetes. And uh, the CEO told me, you know, we put all the guidelines through what we call an affordability filter. We look at various choices that have to be made, like on which insulin are we prescribing to our patients, and we ask, are we pre prescribing the cheapest, most cost-effective insulin? And when they switch from so-called designer insulins, very expensive, patented, brand name insulins, to the generic 70-30, they actually saw an improvement in their blood sugar. And he said, the reason was clear, right? Older people were actually using their insulin appropriately because it was affordable to them, rather than, well, that's very expensive insulin, maybe I will just try to squeak through and not take it. So there are a lot of places that have done this affordability filter, that's a kind of filter. I was just talking to an oncologist in the Washington area, so cancer's my field. And he says, you know, we have a group of doctors and we have now got a system that if you're treating a person with metastatic lung cancer, and you wanna go beyond two treatments, there's no data beyond that. You have to come before five other oncologists in the practice and explain why you think in this case it's gonna be beneficial, rather than just giving treatment where there's no evidence that it improves longevity, improves the quality of life of, or anything. And I think these are the kind of practices. And he said, you know, for us, he, he said, for us, it was worth it because we could then go to the insurance company and say, we're saving you money on the lung cancer patients. We would like you to share some of those savings by paying us more for our office visits and talking to patients about end of life care and other things. That's the kind of change in thinking we need to have happen uh, in the system, change those incentives. Now, why am I optimistic? Because outside of the Affordable Care Act, in this other bill that was passed by bipartisan majorities called MACRA, uh, and don't ask me to tell you what it means, uh, it, um, it's, uh, uh, there is payment change built in, and it's coming online over the next few years. So there are two tracks on it. One track is doctors get paid very explicitly to keep costs down, what are called alternative payment methods, APMs. Uh, there, if the doctors keep costs down, they keep more of the money. In the other track, called the MIPS track, if doctors actually, uh, uh, again, there's a sort of net zero. Doctors who are costing too much money, they're actually gonna be docked some money, and doctors who are high quality, cost effective, they're actually gonna get up to 9% uh, more money. So these cha change of incentives in the Medicare program are going forward, and a lot of private insurers are piggybacking on those uh, payment changes that Medicare is implementing. Um, so I think it's gonna be much more pervasive in the healthcare system and lots and lots of doctors. First, they like it now, right? Because now they can make more money if they're cost effective. They're not penalized uh, for it. And a lot of them feel like, yeah, this is why I came to practice medicine. So I think going forward, it's just gonna become part of what, the way doctors think about their treatments.
Great, we've kind of got a parallel question from the audience, and I should say thanks for all these terrific questions. I can promise you I won't get to all of them, because <laughs> many of them, but they're wonderful questions, and I'll get to as many as I can. Fortunately, several I can bunch, but here's sort of a parallel question from a radiologist in the audience who says, in my practice, I find that perhaps 25% of my work is unnecessary and or inappropriate. I suspect the same is true of other diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. Yeah. What do you suggest for a solution to that? That is a great uh, uh, example of where radiologists have to work with the people who order those tests and systems need to figure out uh, how to reduce uh, those kind of tests. So I'll give you one example of what a uh, place, uh, uh, WestMed in uh, um, Westchester County, New York, just north of New York City, uh, they actually bought a very expensive imaging machine, a, a PET CT scanner, about a $2 million machine, uh, $600,000 to lead line the room that it was in, and uh, I mean, just like incredible amount of expense. And the CEO tells me, you know, this thing is idle, lots of every day, and I like it that way. I said, are you mm. crazy? Mm. I said, well, how, how, why? He says, people, you know, when they refer out, when they used to refer to hospitals, there was no check on the referral. Each one of those scans was $5,000, um, and a lot of them were not necessary. Now it's in-house, we control it, we see whether it's necessary, and we prevent unnecessary tests, like using a PET-CT on a woman with early breast cancer, totally inappropriate, but there are lots of places where it's a very common test. This is where the radiologists have to work with the prescribing doctors to educate them where the prescribing doctors need information back. You know, here's the number of CTs you've ordered for this condition, low back pain, head trauma, whatever. Here's what your peers are doing. And by the way, this is Dr. George, this is Dr. Smith, this is Dr. Wilson. That giving information back with identification of other doctors over and over shows actually gets doctors to improve their practices. First of all, shows them that they're not excelling and second of all, shows them which doctors are excelling mm -hmm. so they can go and talk to those doctors and find out what they're doing right. Um, if you give that information back anonymously, yes. your doctor, here's your performance and it's not A, B, C, D and you don't know who they are, that two-way information exchange, finding out what the good performers are doing right, doesn't happen and performance doesn't improve. These are some of the techniques that I identify in the book um, that have work. There's, you know, almost every place that has tried physician feedback in a timely, almost real, some places do it real time. You can see your performance uh, from the previous day uh, and give it to you, not anonymized, but with identifiers of high performing doctors, sees pretty substantial improvement. I don't know if you'll get to 25% savings, but a lot of places see 10% savings in six months. So here's an interesting sample. So that's that the physician uh, performance measurement, very interesting. What's being done back in the 90s, 25, 30 years ago, by you know, New York State, state of Pennsylvania, publicly publishing Intermountain Healthcare, lots of places, uh, with also some success. Why hasn't that become more widespread in 25 years? So um, I would say uh, two or three things, um, and I'm not an expert in why it didn't expand. The first is um, there wasn't a culture in the medical profession of being accountable for these kind of performances um, and now there is. Second, uh, lots of doctors were uh, chafe at the idea of the data's no good, the data's old, those standards are not the right standards, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we've been able to, if not thoroughly address all of those concerns, adequately address those concerns. Third, I think we've realized you can't just come in and impose it on doctors. Places, again, that succeed, ask the doctors, all right, how do you wanna be held accountable? You come up with the performance measure. We're not gonna come up with it, you come up with it, and it should correlate with what you think is good care, and then we'll get the data, give it to you, and you guys change your practice. So again, you go around to all these places, and they are places that are using standards that the doctors themselves have affirmed, either because they're national standards, like for diabetics, hemoglobin A1C under seven, or there are other uh, standards that everyone in the field agrees to using a preferred chemotherapy regimen uh, according to the National Organization for Patients uh, more than 90% of the time. Those standards docs can affirm and then they're much more willing to uh, adhere to them. So I, I think we tried some interesting ideas in the 90s, 
often we tried it badly, <laughs> um, and we've learned, I mean, I think we've learned from it. The data's also gotten better. So you can give, in 2017, real-time data back, uh, and if it's not real-time, you can give data that's a month old back. That really makes a difference for doctors. That helps a lot, okay. Well, um, we won't go through all 12 practices of transformation, but one I wanted to highlight, because it was so interesting, and it was kind of new, new to me, and it's fairly new to the, the system, too, is scheduling, which seems like a very minor issue, but you point out, and I know many of us go to the doctor's office and are frustrated, we show up on time, we've got serious jobs, we're taking time out of our day, we've got to wait a long time. And you point out that some organizations save from anywhere from 20% to 50% of their appointment slots open for same day appointments, which seems crazy. It seems like that would increase inefficiency, but it seems to increase efficiency, reduce no-show rates, and reduce emergency room visits, sometimes dramatically saving money. Yeah, yeah. so look, when I started this book, there were probably uh, three of the 12 uh, transformational practices that I was sure I was gonna find and they were gonna be critical. You know, chronic care coordination, absolutely convinced. Uh, standardization of practice, absolutely convinced that these were gonna be there, and they were there. Um, but there were eight, nine practices that, you know, high performing places were doing that I would have not, you, uh, you told me, I would have, you know, not, had said, not been on my list of these are gonna be critical. But scheduling turns out to be, excuse me, one of those simple, hard to implement because doctors are resistant to someone else taking the control of the scheduling book, uh, but important uh, changes. Uh, and part of what you say is this, what's called open access scheduling. So when a doctor starts the day, between 20 and 50% of the schedule doesn't have patients in it. Now, I know my father was a pediatrician who worked full time in caring for, if I had told him, Dad, you know, uh, you're gonna see patients scheduled between one and three, but three to five, three to six, we're not gonna put anything on there. He would say, are you kidding? I'm gonna lose all this money, you know, half my time and there are no patients. Turns out that's wrong because, you know, uh, people are sick. People suddenly find that they have t free time and they'd like to get their annual exam done that day. They have a concern, right? It may not be an emergency, may not be an urgency, but that they want to talk to the doctor about. Um, lots of things come up, and we also know that after holidays or weekends, there's more of that. You know, I, I, I'm a little Jewish kid, and I used to work in a hospital, and I, I would say to everyone, I'm working Christmas. I know that there are a lot of you know, other people who want Christmas off. That's fine by me. Not a holiday for me. I'm working Christmas. It was dead, I used to see two movies, my kids would come in and, and play with me, and it was like, great. You know, and I also knew that the next day, all hell would break loose because everyone was at home for Christmas celebrating with the family and not paying attention to their breathing and blah, blah, blah. And then the next day, it was like a disaster. Very predictable, by the way, very predictable. Yeah. Um, so, you know, scheduling turns out to be really important and having those open slots. So I, I portray a, a oncology practice, small oncology practice. And we're not, you don't need to be an organization of 360 docs to do this. Um, they had nine docs, and they keep spot, slots open. Patients are er, uh, encouraged. You're on chemotherapy. There are a lot of side effects. Call us first thing in the morning if you're having a side effect, and we'll either work it through with you, and they have an algorithm given by the National Cancer Institute to work through things like nausea and vomiting or uh, um, tingling or diarrhea or whatever it is. Um, if they need to be seen, you know, the doc has open slots in the afternoon, so they don't go to the emergency room. They don't uh, uh, call 911. Now, it turns out someone told me, you know, that's great. Most practices that initially do this is like, doesn't seem to work. And it's not, and, and he said, we figured out why. Because they didn't look at the recorded message people get when they call up. And the first thing the recorded message, if you think you're having an emergency, call 911. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, it's like, <laughs> yes, there are a lot of small things you need to do to implement this effectively. Uh, but this is a very important change for uh, coming into the doctor's office as opposed to going to the emergency room. And I would say, um, uh, again, you, you hinted at it. One of the things doctors all experience, and, and by the way, mental health providers, worse than anyone, are no-shows. People who have a scheduled appointment and don't show up. And rates vary, but they can be as high as 40 or 50% for some uh, mental health uh, providers. If I schedule at 10 a.m. to see you at 1 p.m., right, the chance that I'm not gonna no-show 
vanishingly small, right? I'd have to have gotten into a car accident driving to the office, right? It helps solve that no-show problem. Um, now, recommendations vary about whether it's 20% or 50% in different places do it differently depending on the access. Um, even more extreme are places that simply take away the appointment book from the front desk person and the doctor and automate it at a call center far, far away so the doctor doesn't control uh, control it and you know part of that is productivity they want the doctors to be seeing a lot of patients but part of that also is that you know we have a tendency to want to see patients who we like difficult patients are difficult right and <laughs> that's not a good thing right it's not good practice uh, sometimes those difficult patients they need our attention but more importantly they might need mental health attention that we're not able to focus on in the 20 minutes or half an hour that we get mm -hmm. but scheduling turns out to be really really important and as i go around the country i you know doctors ask me well yeah i can't do 12. i say i know you can't do 12 but scheduling should be one of the first four you implement mm -hmm. really important well the, the next question i got for the audience is can you run for president in 2020. <laughs> Sorry, shouldn't let, shouldn't let you do that while you're drinking. I, I, my brother is, uh, <laughs> is the politician in the family. And when he was running for mayor of Chicago, someone asked me uh, when I was going to Chicago, you know, when I campaigned for my brother, I said, I don't want him to lose. <laughs> you know, I am not a natural campaigner. <laughs> <laughs> now, when I had you here back in January, I asked you the inevitable question you get asked every time you speak, I'm sure, which was about single payer health care. And you yeah. said, it will not happen in our lifetime. Do you still feel that way? Uh, yes, but, <laughs> okay, now I've got a qualification. Uh, I will tell you um, uh, when I, uh, I think it must have been 2013, 2014, sometime in, in prehistory, um, I came to uh, 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 San Francisco and spoke, and I got booed and hissed when I said I wouldn't, I'm not an advocate of single payer. So let, let me just say um, I'm still skeptical uh, that it will be implemented in the United States. And I just want, I know that I'm in the heart of San Francisco, I just want people to remember, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, we've been talking about single payer for 100 years. 1912, um, you know, began being on the national agenda. It was first introduced in legislation in 1943. Uh, we've had a long history of it not getting passed. There is a contingent of you, a third, and it fluctuates a little bit depending upon how the healthcare system is performing or not performing ardently for single payer. I could give you lots of historical examples where pushing, pushing for single payer undermined actual healthcare reform. I'm not gonna do that now. You can go back to my previous book, Reinventing American Healthcare, to read those historical examples. Um, but I will tell you, here's my switch. Um, if we're gonna go down the single payer route, uh, being the policy wonk I am, we have to learn how to do it right because there are better and worse ways of doing this policy, and we know that previous proposals just haven't gotten traction uh, with the broader public. Um, and so what I'm doing now, literally, uh, and thinking about is, what would a responsible single-payer policy look like? Where responsible, I mean recognizing both the political constraints in getting something passed and the policy constraints of how do you get a single-payer that has reasonable cost control, that drives the system, uh, in the right way without getting gridlock. And here I want you to think of uh, two issues. The first issue is just imagine every penny a hospital or doctor earned came from one payer. What do you think their response when that payer says, we wanna change substantially how we're paying you? Mm -hmm. Right, they're gonna oppose that no matter what. They got business models going out 10 and 15 years based upon that payment and there's like, I don't know how it's gonna work out and therefore, I'm worried about change, I'm gonna oppose it. It's gonna be very hard to make major substantial reforms when all the payment comes from one source. Right now, a lot of places are, all right, Medicare's doing this bundle payment thing or this ACO thing, we'll try it because you know, 70 or 60 or some large percentage of my payment comes from other people and I know it's stable and I can have some flexibility here. If every penny is coming from one source, going to be a little hard to make change. And I'm a guy who thinks we need a lot of innovation, not today, not tomorrow, forever in healthcare. It's not going to end, just like it's not going to end in telecom, it's not going to end in computers, it's not going to end in healthcare. The second thing I would say is, if you're going to go to single payer and you're going to say to all those insurance companies, hasta la vista, right? That's an existential threat to them. 
And we have seen that movie before, <laughs> right? I will remind you, the Clinton plan threatened the existence of all insurance companies. They said we're going to these cooperatives. Uh, and what did the insurance companies do? Did they lay down, roll over, and say, all right, we're going to play dead? No. They launched, uh, some of you may not remember, but the Harry and Louise ads pretty effectively, and they made insurance companies look warm and cuddly. Can you imagine anything <laughs> crazier? Mm -hmm. But they did. I would say, go back to YouTube and look at some of those Harry and Louise ads, and it's like, oh, for my old insurance company. You know, it's crazy. But they're not gonna lie down, and they're not gonna, um, uh, they're gonna fight it tooth and nail. So from a political perspective, you also need to think about how do you do it that doesn't threaten the existence of every insurance company. So we've been thinking about various ideas, um, and you know, that's something I'm actively working on today. Good, well, let's talk a little more about the politics. So I will say, as a guy who spends all of his time talking to healthcare experts right, left, and center, yeah. this is not my opinion, this is my experience, the tendency, strong tendency, the more expert one is in health policy, the less likely they are to back going to a single-payer system. It's not saying universal coverage, more coverage, but a single-payer system, okay? And the most interesting conversation we had last week when we got this group of Zetima group together, which is Democrats and Republicans, and then drug companies and insurers and like a whole variety of people, the most interesting conversation was about single-payer, and almost nobody, even people far on the left, said we should, that the U.S. should actively pursue that. But here's what came up that was interesting. I want to get your thoughts on this. Uh, and this was particularly a concern of people on the left. And they said that if the Democrats run heavily on single payer, they have a huge risk of being exactly the place that the Republicans have been on repeal and replace. They get the base fired up and they find it's just not feasible to deliver on it. So the question is, do you think the Democrats are at a risk of painting themselves into a political corner by running hard and fast on single payer? Mark, I'm a health policy expert. Mm. I'm not a politician uh, or a political <laughs> strategist. Um, so I'm not 100% sure on how the politics breaks down there. One of the reasons I am working on what I like to call responsible single payer is because I do think there are better and worse ideas. And I do think some of them uh, might have some traction. And even if they don't have traction in full, parts of them might be adoptable and, and help reform the system. Um, and on that, I've probably myself moved uh, a little bit um, because I've begun thinking about, I, I think there are some benefits that we might be able to achieve by thinking about how that would play out. Um, yeah, I don't think Democrats should paint themselves into a corner. What we should say is we have very, three very clear goals, universal access, uh, affordability, uh, and therefore keeping costs under control and making it affordable for people. And we want to dramatically improve our quality so it's consistent and everyone across the socioeconomic spectrum can get high quality care. That's our goals, right? We can achieve those in a number of ways. Uh, we have to recognize we're a country of 326 million people. Uh, we are not, uh, you know, uh, Norway with 5 million people. It's much more complicated. We're not even Britain with 60 million people. It's much more complicated in an enormous, varied system like ours. Um, and I think we need to uh, do it responsibly. Um, but having said all that, I, I think there are some you know, creative ways of thinking about single payer that are probably useful. Let's talk about some of the creative ways, because you've said to me before that maybe 70% or so of, of items, uh, health policy issues, people on the right and left basically agree with. So where are those areas of agreement that we could actually move forward on in the near term? Uh, so I think that there are two. Um, the first one is, as I've said, payment change, changing how we pay doctors. Um, I don't know, a few months ago, I was on the radio with a guy from the American Enterprise Institute, a right-leaning uh, think tank, uh, in quotes, in Washington, D.C., um, and uh, um, uh, who I respect enormously. I actually invited him to come and talk to my class at the University of Pennsylvania, because I think, you know, I have uh, uh, conservative health policy people come to my class because I know I pitch from the left and I want my students to hear the other side and be able to ask questions of the other side. That's part of the debate. Uh, actually, uh, uh, I, I have uh, the guy who argued against the Affordable Care Act, that the lawyer Paul Clement coming to my class so that they can hear the arguments against it from a constitutional perspective as well as a policy perspective. I think that's part of the important way. But what was crazy about this radio show is, you know, I kept saying, oh, I agree with Jim, and Jim kept saying, oh, Zeke's right on that. And, you know, it's like, 
uh, this wasn't a left-left echo chamber or right-right echo chamber. This is we need, need to accelerate payment change. So what are those pay, kind of payment changes? Paying doctors differently. We need to do what's called competitive bidding. Uh, Medicare, uh, through the Affordable Care Act, has run an experiment. Instead of just paying for hospital beds or oxygen equipment at, co at home or uh, CPAP machines for people based upon some government-produced price uh, list, you say to producers, all right, tell us what you're going to price it at and competitively bid, and we're going to take, if not, you don't want only to take the lowest, you want to say, we'll take the lowest three suppliers or whatever because you want to keep competition in the system. Um, you know, it turns out that when you do that, we, Medicare saw 35% price savings, a uh, huge amount of price savings on these uh, durable medical equipment things. That's another place we can see more competitive pricing. Uh, we want people to be price sensitive. We should uh, include that. Another area where, uh, again, I refer to the CNN debate last night, Democrat-Republican agreement between Graham uh, and Bernie Sanders is drug prices. President agrees that drug prices are too high. You have not everyone on the left and right will agree, but you have, I think, a big group in the middle that says price uh, drug prices are too high. They're out of control. We've given monopolies to drug companies, uh, and we know what happens if you give a monopoly and don't regulate prices. They go through the roof. Um, we have to regulate prices if we're going to give them a monopoly and do something that is reasonable. So I think those are areas where there is widespread agreement, and we could. I and mean, you know, I had talked to the president, as people know, back in December, in February, in March. And I said, there's a lot of overlap here. That's where I would start because it would propel the system forward uh, and it would not focus on our disagreement. It would focus on places where it would be both good for the American people in terms of keeping costs down and good for the federal budget. And we would show that we could work together. Yeah, they didn't take my advice. All right. <laughs> well, we have a lot of questions about drug prices, and, and that was also one of the most interesting conversations we had at the Zetima meeting, because yeah. we went through all the different ideas, and there wasn't a lot of energy that any of them was really a solution. The most interesting one that's usually uh, proposed is that Medicare should negotiate drug prices. Currently, uh, Medicare beneficiaries get their benefits through Medicare Part D, the drug benefit, which was implemented under a Republican president. It's a government program, but it's private markets with negotiations and some regulation, and very high levels of satisfaction and participation. And this year, the increase in the Medicare Part D premium is a negative number, not even a tiny one. It's negative 3.5%. That sounds like it's working pretty well. Do you think we should replace it to have the government make direct negotiations? Um, if it's any solution to the problem, it's yeah. a partial and small solution, and it's certainly not a solution to the big <laughs> ticket items that everyone's worried about, the $150,000 drugs, the $300,000 drugs, and I'll explain why. So if Medicare's negotiating prices, at best it's negotiating prices for Medicare, which is you know, 55 million elderly uh, people um, and disabled people. Uh, mo many of the people, not most, but I don't know, I, I'm not quick survey here. Many of the people in the room would have zero effect on. Our drug prices would be, if anything, higher as a consequence because the drug company would cost shift. They'd say, I can't make my profit margins on Medicare, so I'm going to raise the prices uh, in the commercial non-Medicare marketplace. Second, Medicare can negotiate where there are alternatives. If there's only one drug in a class, there ain't no negotiating, right? Drug company says, hey, you're not paying my price. I'm not selling you the drug, right? You don't have an alternative. You're over a barrel. Uh, you don't have to be an expert in negotiations like many uh, people uh, to know that that's not a very strong hand by which to argue. Uh, so at best, it's got a limited role. It doesn't have a big role. It's a great talking point, but not a great policy solution in my opinion. So he, let, let, let me just say what one thing that I think is very important for everyone to realize, and I think the drug company, or two points about the drug companies, the drug companies like to hide this. Uh, uh, or let me extend it to three points, um, and then I'll filibuster. First, <laughs> first, let's be clear. We do give drug companies monopolies. They have patent protection, and they have FDA marketing exclusivity. Those are government-granted monopolies to them. We think it's important to provide them incentive to spend the 10 years developing a drug, but we give them a monopoly. Every country that gives 
drug companies a monopoly, regulates their prices, including free market bastions like Switzerland, okay? We, that's the first point, right? If you give them a monopoly, you're gonna have to regulate the price, otherwise the price goes through the roof, and that's what we've seen. Second, let's be clear. Government regulates prices for doctors, hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, lots of other parts of the system, right? When a doctor gets paid by Medicare or Medicaid, the price isn't set by the doctor, it's set by the government. So the idea that we're against the government setting prices, you know, almost half of the healthcare system, right, that's government paid, there are price setting. I'm not a big advocate for it necessarily, but you have to have some of that price setting or some mechanism to actually push the prices down, not up. Now, I can, I, I'm the first to argue that a lot of the government prices are misplaced. We pay too much for procedures, not enough for office visits. I can tell you all of that. But it's certainly better, as imperfect as it is, than you know, some drug company in uh, you know, either London or uh, Basel, Switzerland, or New Jersey saying, eh, this is what I want the price to be, okay? Uh, and the third point uh, I would make is that um, there are uh, mechanisms, and I think the drug companies are beginning to realize it, uh, where we can get some agreement. Drug companies always claim they need these high prices to fuel their research endeavors. That is, okay, maybe partially true. First of all, of the 10 leading drug companies, nine of them do not spend over 20% on their research of their uh, uh, revenue, okay? They uh, uh, spend more on marketing, all but one, I think the exception is Lilly, spend more on marketing than they do on research. So this idea of we have to have these high prices for research, eh, maybe not. Uh, um, and the, uh, uh, the, in addition, I would say they are the most profitable industry segment in America. More profitable than grocery stores, more profitable than oil and gas, more profitable even than financial services. So the idea, do you need 15% across the industry? And there are some drug companies that have 50% profit margins. You need 15% across the industry to actually provide an incentive. If that gets reduced to nine or 10%, suddenly you're gonna stop doing drugs and go into making cars? Be serious, mm -hmm. okay? Lots of places have incentives to be innovative, to develop, uh, uh, to work long term, where the profit margins aren't 15% across the board. Uh, we can do this. Um, so I think then the solution has to be, so how do you establish a fair price and how do you establish a price maximum? I think those are the two questions we need to address. Mm -hmm. I have some ideas on both, but right. working on that. Well, drug prices are high and consumers are particularly uh, aware of them because we pay about 15% of drug costs out of pocket for drugs. For hospitals, we only pay about 3%. Right. Hos so hospital costs are about three or four times the total amount the drugs cost, but we're more aware of them. We've got um, a question about that. It's that's close uh, to 40%. Well, so you gotta be really careful here, and yeah. there's a lot of confusion about these numbers, okay? so. Hospitals are about 31, 32% of total healthcare spending. Uh, a little over a trillion where the uh, total healthcare, national health expenditures is about uh, 3.3, 3.4 trillion dollars. So about a third of it goes to hospitals, okay. But about 16% of healthcare spending, uh, 16 to 17% goes to drugs, both in the hospital and the ones you buy at CVS, Walgreens, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's a little more than half of what the hospitals spend. And here's, but here's the real kicker. In commercial insurance for Blue, uh, uh, Blue Shield of California, for Aetna, for United, drug costs are even more uh, than that, more than 16.7%, because 16.7% includes lots of things that a private insurance company isn't paying, like the research bills, public health bills, dental medicine. Um, so when you actually look at an insurance company, the proportion of your premium that is related to drugs, it turns out to be much more substantial than 16%, and many places it's now gotten over 20% uh, and uh, close to 25%. So drug costs actually tend to be very important to this, the premiums this crowd pays. Great, great. And uh, hospitals too. So the question I was getting to is here in the Bay Area, we've got a very big system called Sutter and it charges a much higher price than neighboring regions. What can we do about that? Healthcare is all local. 
Yes. So I think that, uh, the, you know, there is a lot of genuine concern about what's called hospital consolidation, where hospitals in local markets, local markets, you know, within five, 10 mile radius um, are the only, there's only one or all of them are owned by one company. Uh, that does lead, like monopolies everywhere, to uh, a serious problem of where they have greater leverage and they jack up their prices. And when they're not negotiating with the government because the government sets what they pay, but they're negotiating with private payers, they're able to extract a very substantial premium on that. We clearly need, I think most people have agreed, we clearly need much better antitrust enforcement of these hospital consolidations. I do think the government's gotten better about that. They've sent some signals recently that they're not going, that they're going to prosecute some of these. They're not going to let them go through. Um, but I think we need more enforcement of that and where there, and probably more creative analysis of what is a monopoly and what is the marketplace look like. And maybe you need to have some price caps. You can have 100 and 40% of Medicare, but you can't have 240% of Medicare uh, thinking about that. Yeah. My sense is if you talk to Blue Shield or one of the local uh, insurers, that would be their number one cost yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, question overall. Now, we've been talking about some great um, healthcare issues, most of them somewhat abstract. The average person, when they think about healthcare, they just want to think about getting their own healthcare. And one of the big questions they ask is, how do I pick a doctor? Uh, your book actually has a whole chapter on that, and I thought I had heard everything about this, but you actually had some new ideas. So what simple advice would you give on choosing a doctor? So what do we want in a doctor? Uh, that's what, so I, I, I went back, you know, actually, the, all of you, I'm sitting here writing this book madly because my publisher announced that the book's coming out and I hadn't written a word. And it's like, <laughs> You guys have a lot of faith or you're like, this is not good business practice. Um, so I'm madly writing and my uh, middle daughter moves to Boston uh, and she says, Dad, I need a doctor. Can you tell me who I should go to? And I'm like, wait, I haven't practiced in Boston in 20 years. How do you think I know how to choose a doctor? And I'm like, how would I go about it? Well, I go about it the way all doctors go about it, which is I call a colleague who uh, is in Boston and I said, my daughter needs a doctor, you know, blah, blah, blah. And what does that colleague do? Well, I think X is good, right? There's no data, there's no, like, we don't have criteria. So I'm just like, all right, if I could do it differently, what are the kinds of questions I would ask a doctor's office to say that they're actually doing well? So the first thing I would wanna know is this open access scheduling. I want to have access to my physician and not to have to wait seven weeks to get an appointment. That is, seems to me is something I do want. And it ought to be, uh, you know, Everyone's time is valuable. I know my daughter's starting a new job in Boston, right? Her time is going to be valuable. She can't just take off and sit around in a waiting room. Uh, uh, so that's one. Do you have open access scheduling? Ask the doctor that. Second, you want to know, are they participating in a program of quality improvement? Are they looking at their performance and are they trying to improve and do they have an incentive for improvement? So you ask them, are you so a uh, patient-centered medical home, this is a program run out of the NCQA um, that has doctors do a lot of things, but one of the things it does is they have to look at their data and they have to have a program for improving their performance. I say, all right, if they meet those two criteria, that would seem to me that they're a practice that is really patient-focused, they're working around my schedule or my daughter's schedule, and they're trying to improve their practice. That's the kind of place I would like to go. Now, if you've got some particular problem, you're looking for a doctor for your parents and they have a chronic or multiple chronic conditions, you also want to ask, do you have a chronic care coordinator in the office? You're looking for someone who's got cancer. You're trying to identify the right oncologist. You might want to say, well, do you work with palliative care specialists? Uh, um, so depending upon the if, if you have particular problems, there are other additional questions I point out that you might ask, but if you've got a general, you're looking for a primary care doctor like my daughter uh, in her late 20s, early 30s, you know, the first two questions are open access scheduling and are you participating in some kind of performance improvement plan like patient-centered medical home? I think those are the reliable questions uh, that you should ask. Um, and I think it's much better than me calling up a colleague and saying, who? Uh, yeah. They have no better data than I do. Uh, great, so. great. There's some take-home value for all of you. You can't change the healthcare system, but you can pick a doctor. Well, <laughs> uh, 
We've reached a point in the program where there's time for just one last question, and here it is. If you could make one change in healthcare policy right now, what would that be? I'd like to be the healthcare czar. Does that work? <laughs> okay, good. Um, I think, <laughs> I know my constituent. I should, yeah, run, I should run in California. In um, uh, look, if I had to make one change, it's we've got to uh, press this payment change to doctors and hospitals to make them focus on improving quality and lowering costs. Um, and we have to do it in a number of ways. There's not just one lever, but that incentives change, uh, making it throughout the system for all kinds of doctors and hospitals, that's really gonna be the key to the future. It's coming, but it could come faster. Um, unfortunately, Secretary Price has rolled back some of the things that I fought very hard on to get the last administration to do. For example, uh, we got the last administration to uh, uh, issue bundled payments for cardiac procedures and acute myocardial infarction and make them mandatory and select numbers of cities and then compare those to others to see if it really does save money and lead to better quality. Uh, unfortunately, Secretary Price rolled those back. He's put on ice this competitive bidding for durable medical equipment in the next round of it. You know, that's going in the wrong direction. Ultimately, that won't be the way because of the, this macro bill I told you, but we could do so much more if we had a, uh, a group of people in there uh, that was really pushing this payment change on a very, very broad front uh, because I think that would psychologically get the healthcare system uh, uh, moving and that they would say, you know, we really do have to change our practice. Um, uh, so that's the, re you know, if yes, uh, I'm always loath to say one change because when you're dealing with $3.4 trillion, it's hardly ever going to be one lever. It's going to be multiple levers, but that's, that's the biggie. Great. Well, our thanks to Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel, who's the former chief health policy advisor to the Obama administration and architect of Obamacare and chair of the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the University of Pennsylvania and author of the new book, Prescription for the Future, The 12 Transformational Practices of Highly Effective Medical Organizations. We also thank our audience here in San Francisco for all your attention and great questions, and those on the radio, television, and the internet. I wanna remind everyone here that Dr. Emanuel will sign book plates in the fireside room right down the hall, and we'll send the books to all the purchasers shortly. We also appreciate your letting him make his way to the signing table as quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mark Zitter of the Zetima Project, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>